Hello, this is Hawker Bean, and today we are going to reading r slash d d horror stories. We have seven stories to get through. If you like this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right into this. Sorry about the first time I DM'd the game. Dungeon Master. There were two players, a wild magic sorcerer and a classless human. That sounds really difficult and like a horrible idea for the first time I'm DM for a first time DM. The classless human asked me before the game if he could have zero in every stat. And nothing, not even a class, in exchange for the deck of many the deck of many things. What? That sounds incredibly e e e dumb. Anyways, we got to a point where I had to give him a magic item. He drew the key card, I think. He asked for the luck blade, so I gave it to him without checking what it did. It lets you use wish three times. And it's what he used it for was not to kill his enemies or gold and such, but to manipulate the probability of the deck of many things and wild magic surge. To remember all of it, but he used a wish to make the deck always draw night. He then drew from the deck repeatedly, and used another wish to give him infinite draws. Moral of the story, never let sneaky players get the deck of many things or wish. There's a lot that went wrong here that was not supposed to happen. Hang on. Alright, so I think there's a lot of things that went wrong here. First of all, this is your first time DMing a game. You should probably be say or stick into the core rule book. You have to choose a class. And no, you cannot have a, a zero in every stat. Either point by or rolling is probably the best way to go about out, out, out stats in D&D. In &D. I usually do a a rolling system where you roll um, 4d6s, take out the one that's the lowest number. A lot of people do this, I'm quite sure. I do this playing and DMing, by the way. So people might do point by, where you start out with, um, I think it's... 8 in everything, and then you have 22 points to allocate to whatever set you want to. Don't quote me on that, I'm not quite sure how point by exactly works, but I think it's something like that. And the reason why you usually try to um, have your characters be in a class is so that they can have a sense of progression from um, getting in, in skills related to that class and, and stuff like that. And the reason why I say to never, ever let your players have the deck of many hands or many things or whatever it might be called in, at your table is just simply because it, it never ends well. This deck has been known to have incredibly overpowered things that are great for players and incredibly dangerous things like an instant 
int debt at at card. And if you pull that card, you're dead. No saving throw. And honestly, if, if you let your players use Wish and they wish for the ability to only draw one deck from the deck of many things, just respond with no. You wanted just us luck to be your thing. You don't get to change your luck. Anyway, let's get moving. Okay. Player bullied a player into quitting. I am the GM. Mail 36. I have a three month old campaign. It is our second campaign together, and the group consisted of six players three female, three emails. A nice balance. The newest player to join our group, female 25, let's call her Bella, expressed to me that another player, male 40, let's call him John, expressed to her that his girlfriend, female 39, was not comfortable with their friendship. This GF, let's call her Amy, is also a player in our D&D group. First of all, you're, or, or, you're playing a game together, or probably don't start drama. Secondly, if it's just a wholesome and friendship, I see no reason why I should be e e uncomfortable unless they're like seeing each other behind on your back or something. Let's continue on. So let me write this out plainly. John and Bella are co-workers. I am a former co-worker of Bella and John. Amy only knows all, us all through John and started playing with us when she and John started dating one year ago. After session four, Bella came to me saying she thought she wanted to quit because Amy was uncomfortable with John and her spending time outside of work together. John had better freaking run. This is sounding incredibly toxic from Amy. D&D being the only real instance of that, I explained that I didn't want her to quit and press her to stay on, saying this was a group activity and offered to talk to Amy about it. I talked to Amy about it and she flatly accused Bella of uh, trying to seduce John, something that I found pretty far-fetched. I explained to Amy that she isn't out to her feelings, but if she had to discover with Bella and John's friendship, then that she needed to ooh, communicate with John about their relationship boundaries, etc. Amy seemed to be asking me to boot Bella, which I was not willing to do. This was not received well. TLDR, Amy proceeds to do the following. Spread lies to others about Bella and her, 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 her life. Tress walking outside of d, d which to my credit, I caught her out on but got ignored. Send harassing texts to Bella. Wow. Write several ed posts, which I will not link regarding the pre perceived relationship between John and Bella. Amy's behavior is, at this point, beyond unacceptable. Bella eventually quit the campaign in tears, something John later told me had been Amy's goal. I spoke to John about Amy's behavior, he was generally like, What Amy wants, Amy gets. She is my girlfriend and I love her. Kick them both out. Kick them out now. This is not okay behavior in any sense. It doesn't make any sense and it is incredibly toxic. He is sipping for her heart and refuses to talk to her about it and wants what happened to just die its own death, it seems. I am not willing to give someone who is this manipulative and awful another chance. 
As a GM, I was or am furious and quickly consulted the other players to see how they felt about the situation and about Amy's bullying. I'm sorry. At this point, Amy has already manipulated it and lied about someone to the point that they ran from your campaign crying. You don't need to consult with other players to know that this is a toxic person that you do not want to be hanging out with. While the other players are clearly uncomfortable with what happened, that's enough. Get her out of your game. All seem to be willing to give Amy another shot and do not want the risk want to risk asking Amy to leave for fear of losing John as well. I have considered speaking with Amy one on one regarding what happened, but John and the other players feel that if I do that, Amy will quit, taking John with her, thus unraveling the campaign. Okay, you can start a new campaign, but Amy needs out of this group. John is much beloved in the group, and the other players see Amy as a necessary e evil to keep things going. Honestly? Fine, one of you who can DM him at that point. I'd be leaving. Furthermore, it is the opinion of the group that there is no benefit in talking to Amy as it won't bring back Bella. This makes sense to me and I feel beholden to respect their wishes, but still, the whole bullying thing really leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Amy's behavior is embarrassing for anyone, much less a full-grown middle-aged woman. No kidding. Not only that, but it is blatantly toxic and terrifying. I realized I could just quit the campaign and start from scratch, inviting only the players I deem worthy and kindly leaving out John and Amy. The other boys in the group love John so darn much and want to remain on good terms with him. Well, that's their problem at this point. I'm curious if anyone could help me look at the situation from another perspective. Do I let this go and continue the campaign? Do I walk away and risk having to rebuild a Group from scratch? And I've resolved to kick Amy and let the dominoes fall, and people leave, even the campaign unra uh, unravel, so be it. My next question is do I do it in person, or do I do it over text or in Discord? Based on what I saw with Bella, written communication is the last thing I want to do. I kind of want to be like, hey, want to meet up for coffee, but should I express up front that this is CD related, or should I spring it on upon her? <sighs> yeah, everyone is pretty much saying that, um, yeah, everyone is saying that. Amy is the problem. You should not enable her or let her stay. Alright, let's read that update. Update 1. I reached out to Amy and, shocker, she denied the whole thing. Despite my receipts, she claims she never made the red post and that whatever happened between her and Bella had nothing to do with D&D &D, and that I need to basically stay in my lane. Okay, you can get out of my game, Amy still. You're still not a person I want to be hanging out with and I don't want to play a D&D with you is my only response to that. But she also said, since it's clear that I violated your safe space, I will not be participating in D&D anymore. Yet yeah, D&D is supposed to be a safe space to begin with. I think you can ask John yourself if he wishes to keep playing. Yeah, I'm just gonna say right now that, um... Well, John is 
gonna be given the ultimatum when uh, uh, once she he gets out of that conversation. There were other insults hurled my way as well, which under on, on our grounds for getting kicked. It was a difficult and taxing conversation, but I kept to the facts and did my best not to get emotional. When I described that hurt I felt, she basically said that it wasn't her job to deal with my emotions. This, this is an abuser's phrase. Abusers will do this fun little thing where if you talk about how they make you feel about them to them, they will say, your emotions are not res responsible. If you talk about how they make you feel in front of them, to them, or, 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 or just directly to them, they will always say, your, your emotions are not my, my responsibility. But then if you talk to someone else venting about how they make you feel, they will get mad at you for talking about them behind their back. It is a common thing and it always bugs me. And they will always say, why didn't you come to me about that? And it's like, because you clearly don't care. I understand that Bella is or was a true victim here, but I felt I should add that there are others affected by the actions apart from the person she targeted. Before this conversation, I consulted other members and received the following feedback from the three other players. M2. If John is out, I am out as well. Very disappointing. I would prefer to stay on good terms with John. Don't really know what to make of this. Screw John. Screw Amy. I absolutely will not tolerate this nonsense. Absolutely. Yes, sis. I will reach out to John and let him know my feelings allow him to make the decision to understand that Amy is a persona non grata. I have never heard that phrase before, but I'm guessing in it by context, I'm guessing that uh, you mean and she's not uh, 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 welcome back in the, in the D &D group. I did not expect John to choose D&D, &D, or our friendship for that matter, over keeping his peace with Amy. Yeah, John's in a very abusive looking relationship so far. Amy's gaslighting insistence that I am somehow mistaken about what happened is very upsetting, and considering that I could further with evidence received from Bella and John both regarding the bullying, and sends me that an adult, nearly 40, is acting this way, and that someone I trusted continues to lie to me to my face. And some good news, I met a few people over the weekend who are interested in a one-shot to get to a feel for my way of gaming. And if all goes well, we'll attempt to reboot this campaign with three new players, along with F3. Bella has also said she is willing to play on the condition that Amy and John are not involved. Please wish me luck. Thank you all for the feedback and encouragement to do the right thing. Well, I mean, you were definitely, I mean, it was the only decent decision and was kicking Amy out. This is a icing on the cake. All right, so we have long one. Here we go. I'm starting to get seriously annoyed at a potential player. So I'm organizing a campaign. One friend and four people I recruit at the university D&D &D club. I've been on this subreddit and I've been listening to D&D Horror Story subreddits enough to know that school club D&Ds or at our D&D club things are notoriously hard to enjoy. I've met them all at least once, individually, to help them build their character and explain to them my world. How I tend to do things as a DM, the times we would be playing, etc. Basically, I did a mini session zero with each of them, each one of them individually. You also did a session zero before you went into session one, right? 
I hope so. I mean, this is already mini session zero, but you need a session zero with everyone and together. Now let's continue. Now, mind you, this is not supposed to replace a session zero with everybody present. Oh wow, just re eat, eat, eat the very next line, and I would have already had that, that information. That is amazing. And discussing important stuff like boundaries. And I've told them all we would have a session zero. That it was mandatory for all, and that while we will play regularly on a weekend, the session zero will have to be on a weekday in the evening at around 6 p.m. Fair enough. So, this annoying player, I'm a little bit concerned. First strike was on my first voice call with them, as well as the two other players that took place before I actually met anyone in person. He kept rambling, cutting short the other two, especially the more soft-spoken one, and he just didn't seem to listen. This might be a first-time player. I mean, I know I ramble and cut people off a lot when I'm talking to different people. That's me being a little bit neuro spicy. I would tell him something and then he would just talk for like... For like five minutes about a previous TTRPG experience of him that was vaguely related. Big red flag at this moment. Also, when I was talking about the okay slash not okay things for me as a DM in my campaign, he would agree he would not uh, do it, but also tell a funny story of a past campaign when his character did something like that. Nothing crazy, but enough, enough to make me, and I think the other two, a bit uncomfortable. I had a chat with just him after that, and he seemed to understand, and when I met him for his character sheet, I actually got very reassured. A bit weird socially, but nice and respectful. Yeah, this is definitely, um, so far just someone who, who isn't really good at social things that well. At that point, I tell him again that Session Zero will have to be, in a, be on a weekday and in the evening. He didn't complain or voice it would be a problem. So yesterday, after having met the last person, I make a call on Discord. We'll play the physically, but the Discord is here to help us organize, to choose when we'll do the session zero. I propose nine dates. They all answer, except him. He just says it's going to be complicated for him this week. Mind you, the dates spawn two weeks and a half. I DM him and to try and find a solution. He tells me he has studies every day until 6 p.m., which I know to be BS. In my university, no one is finishing at 6 every single day. But I don't call him out on that. I just point to the fact that 4 out of 9 dates are starting at 7.30 and 7.06, and one of them is already confirmed okay for everyone. Now he tells me that he's just scared he's going to fail his school year if he doesn't sleep enough, so he doesn't want to do it during weekdays, and that he has to wake up at 6 every day. Again, probably EBS, but less obviously so than his last claim, so maybe. So tell him, I don't really know what to answer, but he knew Session Zero was mandatory and that it would be during the weekdays on the evening, unless he didn't listen because he was thinking of what he would tell me next when I was speaking. Which I'm starting to think is likely. I think he just tells me he'll come back to me this evening right now, because right now he has to go to class. So I'm left there waiting and not knowing if I should search for a new player. I mean... You have more than... Enough, right? No, wait. So you have five players. Losing one won't be that big of a deal, will it? I don't know, I play D&D with pretty low amounts of players all the time. Three, four-ish is kind of, of, of the number I usually go with. Anyway, worst thing is right after, or 
or that a friend of a friend contacted me to tell me she heard that I was doing campaign and was interested. So I do have a solid potential replacement, but I'm scared if I kick him out, the other players are gonna think it was to make room for my friend. So I told her we were full. Oh no, why'd you do that? I'm kind of fuming right now. Everything else is going fine, but now if I'm kicking him out, I'm gonna have to explain to the others that it's gonna sour the experience before it even actually starts. Sorry for this wall of text. I really wish I could sort out... Alright, let's read the updates. The comment about DM not setting for doormat hurts a little, but it's because it's kind of true in my case. I'm not very good at being confrontational even when I should be. I pushed myself and explained to the rest of the group about it in far less details and subtle language. The only reason I allowed myself to be emotional and blunt here is because both me and him are, are not anonymous. I'm going to wait a few more hours before telling him he's gone. I'm kind of hoping he's going to come back to me as he promised, and that he's going to tell me himself he can't participate. But if not, like I explained, he already lost my trust, so I push myself once again to boot him. As gracefully as possible, I don't want to be needlessly hurtful. Yeah, that's, that's fair. It's already early evening in my country, and he's been online for a while, so I'm kind of thinking he'll just not come back to me. We'll see. Thanks to you all for being blunt in your responses and pushing me to act. I'll give you one last S update when it's all done. Hopefully, it won't be a horror story ending. Update 2, final. So, he did contact me back, just to tell me that he couldn't participate with the proposed dates. Again, without offering alternative ones. I basically told him I wasn't feeling confident he would be a reliable player based on what I had seen of him. And to not take it as harsh judgment of his character, then I was just erring on the side of caution as I'm an experienced and seen him. I didn't want to potentially make it hard for me. He seemed to not take it too bad, though it's hard to judge with text. At least he was polite, so props to him for that. Sadly, the potential replacement ended up having an incompatible schedule, but she did say it straight up. So she won't be joining, but I had to play us and we decided to keep a party of 4 plus DM, and we decided on a date for session 0. That's what I'm saying, you don't need to replace this guy, you already have plenty of players. So, all is well that ends well, thanks again for pushing me in the right direction, right people. Quite sure they're very happy that it, it did that. Oh dear. That. Well, this story is longer than I thought it would be. Anyway. <laughs> this must be a horror story, but it's looking a lot more funny than horror. Anyway. The party's most terrifying fight. Us! So this isn't a vein of a problem player. It was just horrifying in-game. If anything, I was technically the problem along with the RNG throwing a hissy fit. So I play in a weekly online game. I always openly complain about having the worst stats in the party. I rolled a very extreme on both ends. 17, 15, 12, 11, 9, 7. Everyone else rolled more evenly, but even their worst stats were only mediocre. I think the one other player had a low had a set I think only one other player had a set lower than ten. But I was the only one with two negative ability modifiers. For what it's worth, the complaining was a joke. It was ultimately still my decision to stick with my rolls instead of taking the standard array. 
which incidentally would have left me with the, the worst stats anyway, just in a less extreme way. And I decided to focus my good stats on Charisma, Dax, and Khan. Yeah, you never want to use Khan as your Earth Arm stat. That's a horrible decision. I built a Tabaxi Warlock, Focus on Eldritch Blast and a few AoE spells. Slapped on the Double Sight slash Darkness combo, so I would have something to do if I were caught on to do melee. Took Resilient for Dexterity saves and spent my time roleplaying being very weak. A little below average in intelligence, and well, averagely aware of myself and my surroundings, I guess. No, the other players largely built their characters on vibes, so only one other player invested more heavily in Khan than I did. I had more hatred than the cleric, who was a level ahead of me for reasons. That's a little concerning, but we're gonna continue on. Anyway, on to the actual horror encounter. We're investigating a carnival run by devils, with a general theme of regretful decisions slash being someone announcing who you are. As such, one of the mini-bosses was a doppelganger of sorts, who randomly shifted into each of us in turn, with the DM using our character sheets and sets. When the doppelganger died as one of us, that player rolled a wisdom save against a quirky temporary madness effect from watching themselves die at the hands of their friends. And the monster would essentially revive as someone else until all four of us had a turn being copied. Doppel Cleric was FTK'd by the Gloomstalker Ranger. Doppel Ranger, the only character with con the only other character with con investment, took a few turns, probably because the scene would change every other round to scenes of our previous battles. And we'd have to roll con saves or be too nauseated to move. When he went down, the real ranger developed some kind of hand related body dysmorphia and didn't want to see or use them. Doppel Wizard thankfully inherited the real wizard's player his terrible luck with spell attack rolls. A gracious 15% of her firebolts have hit over the course of the campaign, I'd wager. And the cleric got a good amount of catharsis when bludgeoning her into oblivion. The characters had beef. My character ended up being the final boss of the gauntlet, and Double Me ran circles around the party, reigning untouched for four rounds. Granted, most of the damage that was done was due to the terrain, becoming a river of lava for two turns, and the party, except for me, being unable to see where they were going because darkness. I had also been having a bad streak of luck on the senior change saves from the beginning, since once I was able to move, and we'd happen to shift to a much smaller map where Double Me couldn't run around so much. I managed to damage her enough to break her concentration on the darkness, at which point we held her down and stomped her in the corner. The ranger was still having hand issues for a round or two. So yeah, the ranger officially scared half the party into putting their... ASI is the con on bat and taking the tough feet. All the magic users are making sure they've got strength and intelligence save if so just in case something like this happens again. And I've lost all complaining rights about my stats. Fun time! Your joke was as destroyed. We have three more stories. This video is going to be about an hour, I think. Oh dear. My DM made my friend cry. So our campaign has been going on for a while. We are currently level 14, but there has been some issues down the line. Our DM making encounters unbalanced, pushing one player's story line while others have gotten little to no story, which has made the players who was being pushed upset that no one else is getting story, forgetting plot points, etc. The most recent session our party had been captured and locked in a dungeon. A guest player was helping us break out with her 18-year-old apprentice. 
All of us in jail had no magic items, armor, and weapons we'd collect from. Um, from two guards we killed. Well, our river party was still chained and tied up last session, so we asked to have the spotlight on her. Her spotlight was getting kicked a few times by a different guard in her cell, going in in to headbutt him and getting acid poured on her arm. Other than that, she sat out the two to three hour session. What the heck? We made our way into a chamber where there was a Goliath and a magic user woman. Both these enemies had armor, magical weapons, as well as ridiculously high saving DCs. I rolled a quit a crit to make it a 28, and I was told I failed until the DM remembered he'd allow all the crit successes before. The first half of the session, the DM openly joked and made fun of me until I, asked, until I told him to stop. Now, I self-deprecate it every now and then, and but if me and my friends joke around, they ask for, for jokes, because sometimes I'm not in the mood. It isn't the first time I've had to tell him to relax on jokes, but he went really hard on me. Going so hard to just tell me my life is a joke, which a couple of the players and myself said was too far. Next, he questioned everything I did. Every move, and most importantly, my roles. My character has some high modifiers, and sometimes I roll high. He questioned why I rolled so high, modifiers or not. However, when other players rolled a or I like my friend who rolled the two in that 20s in a row. They asked if the DM wanted a picture or of them to check, and the DM said, No, you're all set. I trust you. After a rough damage session, we found out that somehow the apprentice of the guest character had become possessed. He began to openly mock the guest character, calling her a failure that couldn't save anyone. A horrible excuse for a blood hunter, etc. To scare this entity, she went into her werewolf form and tried harmlessly swinging him around. The DM had her roll on a high DC wisdom check, which she failed, telling her she was now gone into a blood rage. Me and my friend wanted to cast Command and Earthen Grasp to stop her. But not before the DM explained how she beat her 18-year-old apprentice to a disgusting bloody pulp. This session needs to be retconned, and maybe the DM needs to be dropped here. We explained that we wanted to cast before that happened, and let us backtrack but apart. Part of the damage had been done already. We were able to restrain her, but she broke out, and... Uh, he had her damage to friends again before restrained her and broke her out of it while another player broke at her last friend in prison. The session ended with him telling her how she held the broken, swollen, bloody body of her friends who might be alive because she poured a healing potion down her throat. At this point, they were fighting back tears. It wasn't discussed with her that this would happen or if she would be okay with it. And it crossed a big boundary for her. Yeah, this seems really messed up. DM then said that he needed to re-evaluate how he treated people and how he acted and just left the call. I heard they talked and he started to apologize but backpedal a bit. I also talked to him about his behavior with me and now we are on a hiatus for a few months. We all aren't sure of the best course of action right now as we do love this campaign but this session was just very brutal. Yeah, that seems really messed up.
Yeah, that that's a horrifying session, and honestly, I think the DM needs to be talked to. Ow, my eyes. Seriously about that, because... When, when you're doing something like mind controlling or um, something like like a blood rage for or or, or or player character, one rule that I think you we should have is um, always, always make sure that the player character is okay with what uh, what uh, your plans do as DM. Now, you don't spring this sort of thing on a player without them. I'm getting without them having a say in it. It's just not okay. Anyway, next story. The most heartbreaking message in my life from a DM. The story is not as messed up as I see here from time to time, but I still wish to share. My friend invited me to a new game. I didn't know the DM, but I was too tired of DMing myself, so I was all in. Wherever the game it was. Off topic, my friend's character died in the second battle and got bullied for doing so. Off to a great start. I had an idea of a tiefling character who disguises as a human. I don't really I didn't really know how to justify it, so I asked the DM about his his world and recent historical events and in it. Turns out there was a war between the material plane and a hell around a hundred years ago. Tieflings weren't considered enemies by default since material plane was a homeland for some of them. Basically DM said that I was good to go with that character. I have come up with this backstory. My character is a second son of a tiefling general who proved himself worthy during the war. He achieved great success by intimidating his enemies with ruthlessness and brutal violence. So this manner of thinking became his idea for his whole life. Firstborn son of this general should have been his successor. My character wasn't really affected by his father that much. He said with his mother so he'd become a bard and didn't really want to hurt people. He was a really soft and joyful kid, but at some point his older brother left the family or disappeared or was kidnapped. It didn't matter. But I wanted to make it unclear so DM could make a plot hook out of this if he wanted to. And suddenly my kind and gentle character became this brutal general's only possible heir. This was no bueno for the father, but he needed someone to succeed him. It was time for extreme measures. The son was stripped of his name, his nature, and his face until he could until he proved he could be as violent as his father. As soon as he stops playing by his father's rules, he loses his right of inheritance. The point was that father of my character wanted him to live through a cathartic event to change him drastically. That was the reason for me to go on an adventure, to get involved in risky stuff which could either break me or change me. Daddy issues, I know. I don't care. Point is, this is a clear-cut internal conflict. Should I follow my desires, or should I follow, or should I obey my father's will? I was proud of that backstory. I asked my friends who can draw to make a picture of him. I had details like turban on on the head to hide sawed-off horns, or corset to put his tail all under. This parents spent gave me an idea to act like a pseudo Arabian generic warrior. That made a decent and fun character on its own, so I didn't have to reveal myself to other party members early on. I picked a Hexblade Warlock and made a Scimitar my weapon of choice. I got permission from the DM to make the Hexblade an item that can be used as a way to talk to the patron, aka my father. I was really hyped up to play as this dude because I had no other DM for a long time at this moment. I wouldn't really describe this character's concept so thoroughly in any other story, but I want to show off all the effort I put in him. And all the expectations I had, because all of that would be pretty painful to lose in the dumbest way possible. And anyway, we met for the first time to play. There were no girls in the room, only 30 to 40 year old men. 
I thought it was fine until I started noticing some filthy jokes about pretty much every second female character from the DM as well. I didn't really like it, but it was somewhat bearable. First large sign of me getting into the into wrong dang wrong game revealed I when we met a bard NPC. He was sitting in the middle of the room in a dungeon trying to write a song. He kept saying the same three lines he was trying to come up with the rest of the lyrics. I didn't really get what he was singing about. It sounded suspicious, so I thought there was some kind of puzzle with this NPC. At the moment, I was trying to think about it this way. I heard this dialogue. Warrior. Oh, I know how you can end this one. Where he pulls out a phone, starts reading some kind of poetry with completely different rhythm and meaning from the Bard's song. Liam, did you write it? Sure did. Okay, he expresses his gratitude. Have an inspiration. Yeah, um, dude, is this your character thing? Are you going to multi class into Bard or it has something to do with your backstory? No, and no. Why? Enough said. Another red flag appeared after a puzzle was solved. We had an artifact somewhere in the city. To find it, we used an old notebook of a dead wizard. DM asked one player to make an intelligence check. He said there was a poem that contains old street names. We went to the part of the town it was describing, found suspicious looking building, and went in. After that, we went to uh, we found a painting on the wall and decided to break it down because the poem suggested that the artifact was in there. It would be a pretty good mystery unless. We didn't say a word after that intelligence check. DM just kept talking and we kept nodding. Nothing of that matter. We just looked how DM was solving his own riddle. I'm pretty sure that we could stay silent until the end of the campaign. I guess it is okay to skip some of the mysteries to keep up the pace. We didn't have a chance to solve it. Why was this poem there then? Well, I don't know. After some zombie e killing ing and puzzle skipping, we finally get some time for a long rest. My character pays for a press for a separate room and tries to reach his reach out to his father. We skipped the actual dialogue since I wanted to say a secret from my from my teammates. The session is halfway through and we keep going. Later the next day I text the a DM. Yeah, remember that time I locked up in a room? I wanted to say hey to Dad that this journey has been harder than I thought it would be. I'm far from giving up yet. I already wish it would be over. Okay, wait a minute. Can you explain why do you do all this? What? Why do you use the disguise? Well, he wants me to, so I could hire enough and replace him, you know? He's cruel, I'm soft, this kind of stuff. Didn't you read any of my texts about it? Okay, if you make it a big part of your character, why don't you show any of these traits during roleplay? At this point, I really stopped understanding. Well, A, it's an eternal conflict that wasn't triggered by anything outside the character yet, and B, I just wrote to you in roleplaying purposes. After one day of science and chat, I see that promised heartbreaking message. Okay, here's the response from the blades. Your dial ad is lawful good and wants you to make heroic deeds. That was a moment I realized it was pointless to plan good games with this person. Even if I can explain the idea of the character again, I can't be sure or he is not assassinated tomorrow somehow else. The next time on the next game I told 
or um, that I can't fight anymore due to these schedule complications. We had a fight with Hypnotized Crowd of Commoners. I decided it is a great way to go. In any other game with any other DM, I think this was intentional. But now, I think, I think it was just a great coincidence. My character didn't attack women and children at all costs, but there were no party members or the to protect me from them. I got surrounded. I had to attack. After the fight, my character bursts into tears and throws away to St. Hex play. At that point, I say goodbye to all the players in the DM. By headcanon, he became a, a roaming self-educated bard who can't wait to regrow his horns. That is so messed up. Anyway, this one, I literally he grabbed because it was a it was an obvious pretty um, e e hilarious itch looking rage pose. Do I agree with the OP in this? I don't know. I didn't actually read it. <laughs> I just saw it it was very much capsy, and it looked like a very, very angry player was involved in this. So I thought, why not give it a read? Evil, horrible DM doesn't let me do what I I want. Hey guys, really hectic and this right now. My DM didn't let me take the feudal warrior wielder feet, even though I asked him if I could. But you didn't let me do it. <laughs> For context, I am a sorcerer slash warlock multi class. Asimar, who's the son of the god of war, and he has a bunch of tattoos and cool fire powers. And he's a succubus, and he's awesome, and has cool powers. But I want him to do a wheel too, great sword, so he can cut people in half in a fight because he's badass and he's the leader of the party basically and he intimidates everyone else and he's a <laughs> and he's a worker of the night so he does interesting scenes with all the NPCs my stupid DM wouldn't let me do this one freaking thing like seriously I've been there for him like every day I held his hair as he threw it up into the toilet like I've been here a farm for seven years, and now he puts his foot down like we freaking drank together, we smoked the peace pipe, and we exchanged blood. We were our brothers, freaking brothers. And I'm just really mad right now. It needs a vent. Why is there a daily for or a Valorant? I love that. I, I just last sentence is just why is there a daily for Valorant? Like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is clear and so obvious. It is fake, but oh my goodness, that was just too good. We had it on a funny note. That's that's good enough for me. This was our slash. D and D horror stories. If you like this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. Probably gonna be uploading on a on the day that I start my freaking video. That's for sure. Yeah, it's now the eleventh. We started this on the tenth, so it's past midnight. That was great. Anyway, I have no idea what I'm going to do tomorrow. So until then, goodbye.